What wonderful grace What wonderful grace Forgotten Truths is brought to you by people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us today for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we look again into the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us from His Word. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the wonderful things about the work of the ministry is to have companions in labor. Paul says that we're laborers together with God. Uh, we together labor along with the Lord. He works in us and through us. And, and the, the companions that you have to work with in, in, in the ministry, our program here, we have a, have a great crew of folks that uh, come and participate. And uh, our camera people, our floor people, our producers, none of these people are paid anything for doing it. I'm not paid to be here. In fact, we pay to be here. We pay to buy the airtime and so forth. And I'm grateful to have folks that, uh, that make that possible for us to do that. But it, it, they, we're not a bunch of professional operators that are trying to make a living on doing what we're doing. Rather, we're, we're, we're companions together in labor. And we have a wonderful time of just, just doing it for the Lord and fellowshipping in the work of the ministry with the Lord. And when you read in Paul's epistles, you notice that Paul had some people that were like that in his life. Uh, almost all the time you read about Paul's ministry through, through the book of Acts, he's, he has a host of people with him that are laboring together with him. Uh, one young man, probably the, one of the closer uh, companions that he had, was Timothy. He says about Timothy in Philippians chapter 2 that he was, uh, as a father with a son, he hath labored with me in, in, in the gospel. And that's a wonderful privilege to have, a, have someone that you can consider a son in the work of the ministry. And that's, that's not just being, you know, I have three sons, and it's not just like I, I got three children. It's, you know, when I, when I raised my boys when they were young, you love them when they're young and you watch them grow and you, you, you love that. I always look forward to the day when they became ma men. And I enjoy my children now more in their adulthood than I ever did in their, in their childhood. And I loved them in their childhood. I've got grandchildren now and I love the little, the little boogers, you know. <laughs> and, and, and as they grow up you, and watch them become adults, you, you're just excited about that. But when, when he talks about laboring as a father with a son, it's not like, you know, with a little child, a little baby, but it's a, I, I labor with a father with a son, an adult son, someone who can come along and stand along beside me and, and understand what we're doing, and we can labor together. We work together, not just as companions having fun, but in the, in the work, and they're as committed to the work as you are. And that's, that's the relationship Timothy had and Paul, Paul and Timothy had together. They had a mutual understanding of God's will and God's work, and, and it worked in them. Uh, another companion that Paul had, probably uh, even closer than Timothy, probably the closest personal friend Paul had, he mentions him in Colossians chapter, f chapter number 4 uh, and verse number 14. And that's uh, his, his, uh, his dear friend Luke. Colossians 4.14, he says, Luke the beloved physician. And he's talking about uh, greeting one another. Luke, the beloved physician. What a title. Uh, the beloved. <laughs> Somebody Paul loves. Somebody who's dear to Paul. You know, that's a word that, God, that Paul uses in Ephesians when he says we've been made accepted in the beloved. When you understand how God looks at you, you understand how much, we, that, that term, the beloved, that's a title that God the Father gave to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ when he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And when Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 6 that he's made us accepted in the beloved, he could have said he's made us accepted in Christ because he just said he'd chosen us in him. And then next verse he's going to say, in whom we have redemption in Christ. But he, did, he, he, he puts that title on the Lord Jesus Christ to remind you that the one in whom you have been accepted before the Father is the one that the Father loves. When you understand how much God the Father loves his Son, then you understand how much he loves you and me who are in his Son. And Paul takes that title of how the Father values and cherishes the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son. And then Paul repeatedly through his epistles uses that term. It wasn't just a, 
It was, th this was not just a throwaway term. You know, sometimes people say, my beloved, and, and they talk about, and they just use that as a term for everybody. That's not the way Paul used the term. Paul used that term of endearment because it meant something. And he understood, you're someone that I love the way the Father loves the Lord Jesus Christ. I have that kind of compassion and love and value and esteem for you. And that's the way he thought about Luke. Luke was, Luke, if you go back and read the book of Acts, Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts, volume 1, volume 2. Luke came into the life of the Apostle Paul in Acts 16 when he's going to go into Macedonia. And all the rest of the book of Acts, you, you have what, what if you read, the, you read the record, you'll say, he says, we sailed, we did this. Luke is with Paul. Now, there are a couple occasions when Luke isn't with Paul. And he just talked, but ma the majority of the time, from Luke 16 onward, Luke is with the Apostle Paul at tremendously important times in his life. That great shipwreck that he went through in Acts 27 and uh, so forth. Uh, Luke was there with him on that shipwreck. <laughs> he, they, they'd shared some real exciting adventures together in the gospel ministry. And so Luke was, was very uh, close to Paul. In fact, well, a fascinating verse, 1 Timothy chapter 5, chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 5, when Paul is, it, it makes a, a statement, 1 Timothy 5, 18, he said, The scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth the, out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his, war, his, um, uh, his reward. And he said, The scripture says that. And when he says that, he quotes two passages. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 25, you won't muzzle the ox that treads the corn. And he quotes Luke chapter 10, verse number um, 17, where, he, where, where the Lord Jesus Christ uh, he, uh, says the laborer is worthy of his reward. Luke chapter 10, verse 7. I'm sorry. Think about that. The Apostle Paul had the author of the book of Luke with him. They were buddies. <laughs> He says, this, this, this is my beloved. Um, they were, there was such command. And, and, and Paul, when he quotes the book of Luke, he calls it scripture. <laughs> he already knew it was scripture. You see, your New Testament, don't ever let anybody ever let you tell you that the Bible wasn't, was put together in the fourth century by a bunch of stodgy old church fathers. No, no. Your whole Bible, your whole New Testament scripture, the Old Testament, we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible is already established and, and in use before the time of Christ. When Jesus came on the scene, he authenticated and used it and called what, what the, the, it the scripture. But then you have the New Testament being written, Matthew to Revelation. And the books of Matthew to Revelation were all written, listen to me now, they were all written in the first century. In fact, they were all written collated together in a form that you have it now in 27 books and distributed as a book throughout all the, 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 the uh, Christian community. All of that done prior to 70 AD. Wow. Now I know that goes contrary to what people tell you in the books, but it doesn't go to contrary to what in the scripture itself gives testimony of itself. It's, it, it, as soon as Acts chapter 6 you read about the Word of God increasing. God's Word was beginning to, just like Jesus had told them in John 14 and John 16, they were going to begin to make records of what was there. And Luke, when he comes along, he makes a record. And it's his record that Paul is the most, most familiar with and that he quotes. And that's fascinating because in Acts 20, Paul would quote the Lord Jesus and say, as Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's not found anywhere else in the Bible. <laughs> well, had Paul known that Jesus said that, he had with him someone who, Luke chapter 1, was a good historian. Luke is an educated, trained researcher, a science researcher, a medical physician. In Luke chapter 1, when he writes the book, the first four verses, he says, look, O Theophilus, I'm, I'm writing to you, and I've been a good historian. I've gone out and got eyewitness accounts. I've talked to firsthand sources. I didn't, this is not rumor. This is historical records that I've checked, talked to the firsthand witnesses, and you can count on the historical accuracy of what I've done because I've been a good historian. And it was this man who was the companion of Paul. Don't you know they spent nights and days, journeyings often, talking about what Luke had discovered about the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Philippians, he says, that his heart's desire is to know him. And don't you know he would want to know all about him? 
Don't you do that? I read through the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I want to know about my Savior. I want to know how he, how he thought, how he reacted, what he did. And I know that the program he's living under there, that Old Testament Jewish program, isn't the program I live under, but his or the way he related to the Father, the Father's Word. Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And I look back then, I see, and Paul had Luke with him. No wonder he called him the beloved, <laughs> the beloved, close, personal companion and friend. I hope you have people like that in your life. But what I really want you to see in Colossians 4.14 is he called him the beloved physician. Because and Colossians is one of the last epistles. Paul's in prison here. And when he calls him the beloved physician, it's because Paul obviously needed the, the ministry and the help of the physician. He needed the skills of, 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 of a doctor. And he, needed, he benefited from Luke being with him. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, Verse 10, the last thing Paul writes, the last book he writes, he says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 11, only Luke is with me. Only Luke. He sent other, some people have defected. He sent other people other places. But Luke is with him. Luke, the beloved physician, there to minister, there to, to, uh, uh, to be of benefit as a medical doctor to the Apostle Paul. Now, there's a puzzling issue there, if you think about it. At the end of Paul's life, he's got the physician there. The Apostle Paul, come up with him in Acts chapter 19, is a guy who, you wonder why in the world would he need a doctor? Acts chapter 19, and this is something that goes through all, all through Paul's ministry here at this time. Acts 19 verse 11. It talks about the Apostle Paul, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. You could take a piece of clothing, a piece of, uh, of, of apron, a, a handkerchief, as we, as we would say, from the body of Paul, and take it and lay it on sick people, and the power of healing from God to physically restore them to health. Not, not take away a headache, not, not, not get rid of a, you know, some psychosomatic disease that nobody can see like people do today. But the lame, lame man, given, 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 given wholeness of body. Acts chapter 20, 28. If you come over here at the, right at the end of the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul lands there in, in Melita, and verse 3 says, And when Paul was, had gathered a, a, bundle of, a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper, a snake, a poisonous snake, out of the heat, and fastened on his hand. Snake bit him. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said unto themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he hath escaped the seas, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. So they thought that some calamity came, must be the gods getting him. And he shook off the beast. Paul just took the snake and shook it off into the fire and felt no harm. <laughs> and the, the heathen there looked on when they saw that he, he should have swollen and fallen down dead, but after they had looked a great while, saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said, he was a god. Now here's Paul gets bit by a poisonous snake and it doesn't affect him. He didn't feel any harm. He didn't swell up. He didn't have to go, you know, cut the X and suck the venom out. He just had a, a healing. Verse number 8 Acts 28, 8, it came to pass that the father of, of uh, Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid hands on him and healed him. So when there was done others also, this was done others also which, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. Paul had the capacity to heal himself, check off the snake, he had the capacity to heal others. He had the capacity to, to lay hands on people and they'd get sick. He had the capacity to take an apron, a piece of clothing, and send it across the way and heal people. What in the world would he be over here with a physician? 
why would he need the ministration of a physician? And if that isn't all, look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. There are a couple of verses back here in these epistles that are just, you know, they're, they're, if you th when you think about them, they, 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 they can be a puzzle. Here's this great apostle who could heal himself, be immune to a snake bite, heal others, yet at the end of his life, look at what he tells Timothy, his beloved son in the faith. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. Now you would think if he was going to go over there and heal a dude in Acts 28 that he didn't even know that this dearly beloved son in the faith, instead of prescribing medicine, and by the way, Luke is with him, remember, and he's probably got the doctor's prescription and said, here, Tim, take your medicine. And by the way, when he says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach, notice he says, he didn't say, drink a little wine. He said, use a little wine. I started my preaching ministry decades ago in an inner city rescue mission. And every guy that come into the rescue mission knew about, they knew two passages. They knew this one and the new Proverbs 30 about give to the guy that's depressed uh, uh, some, some uh, wine and strong drink. And they knew this. And they said, oh, Brother Rick, you know, Paul said, drink a little wine. But he didn't say that. He said, use a little wine. There's a difference between drinking it and having it prescribed for medicinal purposes. He's talking about medical attention. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the very last thing Paul writes, verse number 20, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus, another one of his companions in the work, have I left sick at Miletum. Have I left at Miletum sick? Now think about here. Here's a guy at one point can heal people, send off handkerchiefs across the way to heal them, and now he's got a medical doctor attending to him, prescribing medicine for one of his dear brethren in the work, leaving another dear friend and companion in labor sick. He said, well, why? Why if a guy can heal people, would he prescribe medicine, and why would he leave somebody sick? And why, do he, why would he have to have a physician attending his case? Well, the answer to that kind of a puzzlement there it really is in just noticing when these things are recorded in Paul's ministry. When you see Paul healing people, when you see Paul himself immune to diseases, that's always historically during the book of Acts. After the book of Acts, Colossians, Timothy, 2 Timothy, when Paul is saying you need to check with the doctor, seek medical attention, take your medicine, and in the end, it didn't go, none of it's going to do you any good. <laughs> You're just going to be sick. By the way, the ultimate disease, disease is death. The death rate still won a piece for everybody. Paul would go into someone who was dead, Acts 20, and raise him from the dead. <laughs> he had that power, miraculous power. What did he do? Second Corinthians. 12, 12, he says he did the signs of an apostle. He had these miraculous thing. That thing in Acts 19, I read you a moment ago. You notice he did special miracles. This was not the norm. This was not something that he did all the time. This was something he was doing that God gave the capacity to the apostles to do in order to validate their ministry, authenticate who they were. And if you, if you see that temporary nature of those spiritual gifts back there in the Acts period, the gift of healing was something that was temporary in nature. When you understand the, the nature of those gifts, you understand why they don't carry over. Come with me to the book of Exodus, chapter number 30, 34. And I know folks, you know, they get all bent out of shape when you talk about something being done temporarily and that it isn't something God does forever that he had a purpose for it at one time, that that, that purpose 
uh, having been accomplished, it, it's no longer a need. People say, well, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> like that's supposed to mean that he has to do exactly the same thing all the time. Like he can do the same thing. He can do anything he wants to do. But the key is, does he? People say, you're just limiting God. No, but you know, did you ever read over then in Genesis chapter 9? When God told Noah, I just destroyed the earth with a flood. Can God destroy the earth with a flood? Absolutely. He already did. Got the testimony in the scripture that he did it. But you know what he said next, Genesis 9? He said, I will never again do that. He said, I'll give you the rainbow. We had a covenant with Noah, gave him a sign of the covenant. And he said, I will never again destroy the earth with water. Can God do it? Sure, he already did it. Will he do it again? No. Why? Because he said he wouldn't. You say, well, that's just limiting God. No, God is a sovereign, free will person. He can do what he chooses to do. He's already demonstrated he can. Now he said he won't. He can do it, he just won't do it. That's not limiting God. All that stuff about limiting God, Jesus Christ today, same today, yesterday, day and forever and all. You know what that is? That's preacher talk. Because they can't face the reality of the truth of what God's Word says about their denominational teaching and their doctrine that they got from their system. That's all it is. Now, if you're, if you're a searching heart, now if, if that's where you want to be, it's okay. I don't care. It's, okay. it's up to you. Be where you want to be. But if you're a searching heart and you're looking for an answer for why healing doesn't come from God to you the way in the scripture it says it does, there's an answer for you. Exodus chapter 34 verse 10, God says to Moses, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people, the nation Israel, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation. And all the people among whom thou shalt go shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. God does these signs and wonders in Israel. Made a covenant that he would do. He covenanted with the nation Israel to demonstrate and to validate their program and where they were in their program. If you go to De Deuteronomy chapter number 11, he tells them, uh, Deuteronomy 11, Leviticus 26, all the pa passage after passage like that, he tells them, if, Deuteronomy 11 verse number 13, it shall come to pass, if you will hearken and diligently unto my commandments, that I will command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you rain on your land in due season. Then he says, if you disobey me, you know what happens? I'll withdraw the rain. I'll shut up the heavens. Israel had a way to look around them at what they were experiencing and know how they were faring in God's program. Exodus chapter number 15, the healing was the same way. Here's the verse about healing. People like to quote, nobody knows where it is, Exodus 15, 26. And God says to, uh, the Lord says to them through Moses, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Jehovah Rapha. I'll heal you and your land if you keep my commandments. You see, they had a way to look out at what was going on to, in, the, in, in, in the nation of Israel and know how the nation was faring in God's program. That's why in Judges chapter 6 when Gideon, he says, where are the, where are the miracles? <laughs> you know where they are? They weren't there. Why? Because Israel was failing. You come to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke 8. 
verse 1, he says that Jesus went about preaching and showing the kingdom of God. Went around making them see that what, through, through, the, through the healing ministry and the demon casting ministry that he had, that he was bringing God's message to them. The healing, the signs, the spiritual gifts, all those things were designed by God to show to Israel and to those who watched there's God's work. In Paul's ministry they did that. Through the fall of Israel, salvation goes to the Gentiles through the ministry of Paul. And what happens? The God of Israel goes out with Paul in his ministry and says, you know where God's, Israel's God is? He's out there with the Gentiles with Paul's ministry. It's a way to validate God's word. They would see God's word working. Now what's happening today? Today Paul says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Today we don't walk by looking at circumstances and situations in life to find where God's work, working. Today, we look into God's Word, rightly divided, and we walk by faith and an understanding of what God says He's done for us in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why trusting Him and Him alone allows God's Word to work in us and then out through us demonstrate the wisdom and life of Jesus Christ as it's revealed in His Word. So we walk not by faith, not by sight, looking at circumstances to find whether God loves us or doesn't love us. We walk by faith that looks to Calvary and sees the value of God for me in the cross work of Christ. Well, they said we got to go. Thanks for being with us today. Till next time, Maranatha.